613th mitzvah is in this week's parsha. According to the order of the Sefer Achinoch, it's the mitzvah of Ksiva Sefer Torah. That every Jew is obligated to write for himself a Sefer Torah. And the Gemara and Hedrin and Avchaf Aleph learns this from the Pasuk, which says, Viata. And now, this is Hashem speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu. Kisvu lochem asashira hazais. Write for yourself this shira, this song. The lambda is b'nei Yisrael, and teach it to the b'nei Yisrael. Sima b'fihem. Place it in their mouths. So when it says, v'yata kisvu lochem asashira hazais, write this song, the Gemara derives from this the mitzvah of writing an entire Sefer Torah. The simplest interpretation of the drasha is that Shira is a reference to the entire Torah. Why would the entire Torah be called a song? Before some of various interpretations, the Netziv, in the Zagdom, to the Hamagdover and Chumash, has an arichus to explain this. But for our purposes, let's just leave it at that. That there is an interpretation of the Pasuk which runs like this. The word Shira means Kala Terakula. The Rambam in Perak Zion of Hilchas Sefer Torah says a different shot. He says that Shira here in this context refers to the Shira Sa'azinu, which is going to be in next week's parsha. And how did Chazal derive from here a mitzvah to write an entire Sefer Torah? Because we have a cloud, ain kais ben Torah parshias parshias. Not a lot to write individual chapters of Torah. The sister was suspended later on for various reasons, but miikar adin ain kais ben Torah parshias parshias. And therefore, if the Torah says to write the Shira Sazinu, can't mean just to write the Shira Sazinu. You can't write an individual parsha. It must mean to write an entire Sefer Torah which contains the Shira Sazinu. But the word Shira refers to Azinu. This is the Rambam's Pshat. The Achroinim asked many kashas in the Rambam. Number one, they point out, the Shagasaya points out in the Chuda. That the Rambam himself says, although you can't write the Torah Parshias Parshias, but you can write one Sefer, an entire Sefer by itself. So if Shira really means Shira Sazinu, just you can't write Parshias Parshias, how do you know they have to write an entire Sefer Torah? Perhaps Sefer Dvarim should be enough. That's the Shagasarius Kasha. Many other Achrayim, among them the Chsam Sefer and Gitten, ask a different kasha, that we find that there are certain mitzvahs that entail writing individual parashiyas. Mitzvah of tefillah, therefore parashiyas and tefillah, the mitzvah of mezuzah. So we see that there are mitzvahs in the Torah which require us to write individual parashiyas. So if shira means the shira sazinu, Maybe we should be able to write just the Shira Sazinu. We know different than the Mezuzah, no different than a pair of Tzvil. So these are kashas that I didn't ask in the Rambam. But al Kaponim, we have two Pshatim in the Pasuk. The Shira either refers to the entire Torah, the entire Torah is called Shira, or it refers to the Shira Sazinu specifically. The Marsha in uh, Masech Shabbos says that this question as to what the precise meaning of Shira is underlies a machloikas in the Gemara in Shabbos, Nafkuf Lamed Ches. See, there's a pasuk later in our parsha where HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us that when Klai Yisrael will experience terrible suffering, so the Shira will be a witness. The Shira will be a witness. Again, what does the Shira mean? Presumably, 
We'll have the same machlaikas. Either it means the entire Torah is a witness, or the Shira Sazinu is a witness, but the Shira will be a witness. Kilosi shochach mi pizarro. For it shall never be forgotten. The Pasuk tells us that the Shira will never be forgotten. Keeping that Pasuk in mind, we have a Gemara in Mesech Shabbos that brings the following. Amarav. The time will come that Torah will be forgotten. Where do we see this? Shenamar, it says in the Pasuk, it's in the Teichach of last week, Hashem will smite you with a, an amazing Maka. So, Haflozu Amal. What could this Maka be? This Vihifla. So, we have a proof from a pasuk in Yeshaya. It says, I will smite this nation a maka, which is half levofela, which is amazing. And the end of the pasuk says, And the wisdom of the chachamim will be lost. So therefore, we understand that this half of fellow, this half law, is a reference to forgetting Torah. So when the Torah, when it says, the time will come, the Hifla Hashem is Maka that Maka is the Shikha Satayra. The time will come, the Torah will be forgotten. And the Gemara continues. It says, Ton Rabbanon, Kishinich Nesur Abbasenu Lekerem V'yavna, when the Chachanan came into the Yeshiva of Yavna, Amru, they said, Asida Torah Shetashtakach Mishroi, the time will come, the terror will be forgotten. Shinemar, they bring a different source. Pasuk in Omais, famous Pasuk. Days are coming. Vishlachti ra'av ba'aretz. I will send a famine into the land. Lo ra'av lechem, not a famine for bread. Lo tzama lamayim, not a thirst for water. Kiim l'shmaya is divrei Hashem. There will be a hunger and thirst to hear the word of Hashem. Now, on the one hand, that's a very nice thing, that people will want very much to hear the word of Hashem. There are at least two nugunim that I know that were written to this pasuk, which conveys the idea that uh, there's going to be this great thirst. But the implication of the pasuk is that this will be an unsatisfied thirst, that people will want to hear the word of Hashem, but no one will be able to provide it. As the Pasuk continues, people will roam from sea to sea, from north to east, they will roam and they won't find it. So this great hunger and this great thirst will not be satisfied. Why? Because terror will be forgotten. So the Gemara says, what does it mean they'll roam? So the Gemara says that a woman will have a loaf of bread of truma, and she will go from Beis Medrash to Beis Medrash and ask whether it's Tameh, whether it's Tahar. And the Gemara says, what? How could such a thing be possible? That bread can become Tameh is a pasuk. Even if Torah is forgotten, they're not going to forget explicit psukim. So the Gemara comes out with maskana, that the question is going to be whether it is a Rishon Latuma or whether it's a Shein Latuma, what level Tumah it has. And it's going to revolve around the question how to understand the halacha that a Sheretz defiles an oven. And the Gemara gives a technical explanation for what the question will be. But uh, that's what it means, Torah will be forgotten. I'm almost reminded of the story of my Rosh Hashida. The my Rosh Hashida is so in the end of his life, he was lamenting the fact that he was losing his memory. So he was always telling this uh, younger man who would help him in the house, I can't remember, I forget. So this younger man asked him, says, Vas forgets the Rosh Hashiva. What is the Rosh Hashiva forgetting? A Taisvas? So his name, Chas V'Shalom. How could you forget a Taisvas? I forget my uh, shiurim, my chidushim. I can't remember. But a taisvas? Can't forget that. 
So it seems that the Gemara is saying that even like the Chachamim, that Torah will be Nishtakham Yisrael, they're not going to forget a Pasuk, they're not going to forget a Mishnah, they're going to forget a technical point of Halacha. And that's the Shikha Satera, which is foretold. The Gemara then brings a Brahis to Tanya, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai Aymer, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai says, Chas v'shalom sh'tishtakach terim Yisrael. God forbid terim should be forgotten. Shinemar, as it says in the Pasuk, Ki lo si sh'achach mi pizara. Our Pasuk. Terim will never be forgotten. So the Marsha in Shabbos says, so what does the first Brahisa, what does Rav do with the Pasuk of Kilos Shachach Mit Pizaro? This Pasuk, from which Shumri Yochai proves Torah will not be forgotten. Those who say Torah will be forgotten, what do they do with this Pasuk? So the Marsha in Shabbos says that the issue is exactly what does Shira mean? Because according to Rav and according to the first Brahisa, Shira is a reference to the Shira Sazim. There's a special haftacha on the Shira Sa'azinu, Kilosi Shachach Mipizaro, that that will never be forgotten. But the rest of Torah can be forgotten. But Rabbi Shimon Be'achai holds that Shira is a reference to the entire Torah, and therefore the haftacha, the promise of Kilosi Shachach Mipizaro, applies not only to the Shira Sa'azinu, but to the totality of Torah. Torah will never be forgotten. So it's very, very interesting. Now the Marsha takes this Shaila. Tupshatim in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, and he fits it into the Gemara in Shabbos and says that really is the Machlokas between Rav and the first Braisa on the one hand, Rishon Bechai on the other hand, whether Shira is a reference to Shira Sazinu, that will never be forgotten, but Torah could be forgotten, or is it a reference to the entire Torah and the entire Torah can't be forgotten? Mr. Agav will mention that the Shagasari and the Tshuva shows that this Shiloh, what she re- refers to, is really Machlekes Vishaynim. In the Gemara Nadarim with the Lamadalib, he shows that it's Machlekes, the Ran and the Rush, how to understand. So it's a little bit of a, a total. But this is the Machlekes. So the Gemara asks the question, or Rabbi Shemuel asks it himself, Elamani Mekayim, so what do I do with the Pasuk? Of Yeshaytu to Levakish, as Tavar Hashem Elo Yimtso. If Torah will never be forgotten, what are they with that Pasuk in Amais, which says they will roam to seek the Dvar Hashem and not find it? So the, he answers, Shlo Yimtzu Halacha Berura U Mishnah Berura B'Makam Echad. You're not going to find clear Halacha and clear Mishnah in one place. What does that mean? You won't find Halacha Berura U Mishnah Berura B'Makam Echad. So, Svarim explains the following way. I'll bring it up with a moshe. Let's say you have a, a maggot shear in a yeshiva. He's giving a shear on a very, very complex sugya. And in this sugya, there are many different shitas, many different opinions. Rashi has a shita, and Rabbi Matam has a shita, and the Ramban has a shita, and the Rambam has a shita, Ritva has a shita, many different shitas in the Gemara. And uh, there are proofs and counterproofs to all the opinions. So none of the opinions is immediately understood. Each one has a problem, each one has a difficulty. So the Magachir analyzes the Sugi very carefully, and he shows how each approach to the Sugi works perfectly. He resolves all the difficulties, and he resolves all the contradictions, and he shows how each one read the Gemara and how each opinion is consistent with the other opinions of that mission elsewhere in Shas. It's a magnificent achievement. The Sugi is now totally illuminated. That's Mishnah Brura. Right? Mishnah is the source material of Torah. So when the source material is clear, everything is consistent with the original sources Mishnah But the problem is, we still have five different approaches to the sugya. So, halacha lamaisa, what do you do? Do you do like Rashi? Do you do like Rabbi Natan? Do you do like the Rambam? Do you do like the Ramban? Do you do like the Ritva? So, the Magashir says, I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer that. 
right? Each mahalach is so beautiful and so consistent and fits with all the other places in the shas that are relevant to the subject, but whose arguments are stronger, whose arguments are weaker, the kayach of achra, the ability to, to make a decision that we don't necessarily have. So you can have Mishnah Brura, but you don't have Halakha Brura in the same place. And the truth is that this is an amazing thing that we find nowadays. You know, there are various types of Tamid HaChacham. Sometimes you have a Tamid HaChacham who is brilliant in his analysis of the Gemara and the Bishayim. But if you'd ask him, Halakha Lamaisa, what do you do in this situation? Even in the situation covered in that sugya, he couldn't necessarily tell you. And then you have a person who has the halacha lemaisa on his fingertips. He knows exactly what Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says on this case, and exactly what Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach says in this case, and exactly what the Shemir Shabbos Kolchas says in this case. But if you ask him, well, how does this all fit with the original sources, with the Mishnah, with the Gemara, with the Rishayinu? He doesn't know that. He knows the Psakim. He knows the final rulings. He can give you a halacha brura, but he can't give you Mishnah brura. And uh, the tragedy is, as Mishum Yochai says, that we don't have halacha brura, Mishnah brura, b'makamacha. So therefore, that's the meaning of the apostle, you showed it to It's not the Torah will be forgotten. It's that you won't have Mishnah brura and halacha brura, b'makamacha. Now at first glance, this seems to be a distinction that makes no difference. Because if you want to know what to do, what difference does it make whether the Torah was forgotten, or whether nothing was forgotten, just that there's no halacha brura, mishnah brura, makamecha, either way you don't know what to do. Halacha lamaisa, you don't know how to conduct yourself. So what difference does it make exactly how that predicament came about? Did it come about because something was forgotten? Did it come about because we don't have the ability to machria among the various approaches. Either way, we're lost. So why is this considered a better alternative than the alternative of Sheikh Hasatayra? What's even more interesting is that if you look in the Sifri in Parshas Ekev, Rav Shum B'Yochai is quoted there differently than the Gemara has it. In the Sifri, Rav Shum B'Yochai himself says Torah will be forgotten. In the Gemara, he says it won't be forgotten. And the Sifri says it will be forgotten. And the Sifri asks on him, I, what do you do with the Pasuk of Kilosi Shachach Bipizaro? So he says, No, it means, when I say that it will be forgotten, it means that Ish Plaini Mitayer, Ish Plaini Mitame, that this one says Tome, this one says Tar, and this one says Kosher, and this one says Treif, and they won't find a clear Psak. So in the Gemara and Shabbos, that fault, not having Mishnah Burah and Halacha Burah Makam Echad, is called Torah not being forgotten. And in the Sifri, that is called Torah being forgotten. So it's funny. So how do we understand this? Obviously, if we can't be machriya, that means something was forgotten. That's what the Sifri is telling us. So why does the Gemara and Shabbos quote tell us, no, chas v'shalom Torah should be forgotten. It's only that we don't have mishtu bura and halacha bura b'makam echa. I think that to understand this, we have to speak about a concept, which Chazal talked about in several places, that when we have a dispute, Chazal say, Eilu ve'elu divrelikem chayim. That both sides of the dispute are the words of the living God. And one of the places where the Gemara says this is the Gemara in Erevin. The Gemara says that for two and a half years, Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, they argued about the various points of law about which they disagreed. And finally, after two and a half years, a Baskel came forward and said, Eilu ve'elu divrelikem chayim. The, these and these are the words of the living God, but the halach is like Beisil. So the question is, well, if the halach is like Beisil, so in what sense is it Elu the Elu the Chai? 
So the Ritva there in Erevin brings that the Chachmei Tsarfas, the Chacham of uh, France, asked this question. And they said the following. They said that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemayim to receive the Torah, on every topic, every subject, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed him Mem Tes Panim Tame and Mem Tes Panim Tor. 49 arguments for Tame and 49 arguments for Tor. That means there is nothing in Torah which is black and white. It's not either or. There are 49 pros and 49 cans. 49 arguments for Tomei, 49 arguments for Tor. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not tell Moshe Rabbeinu which arguments outweigh each arguments. That, the, the assigning the weight to the various stadium, that was something that was given to the Bezdin Shlomata. That was given to the earthly court. So the arguments themselves, the mem tes panim tamay and the mem tes panim tohar, that was given by the Ribbon of to Moshe Rabbein. Assigning weight to the various arguments, that's the job of the Bezdin Shlomata. So the Bezdin Shlomata might say, to me it seems that these arguments are weightier. Or those arguments are weightier, and therefore they'll be machriya. But that hachra didn't come from the Ribbon Shalom. And therefore, from the Ribbon Shalom's perspective, Elu ve'elu diri lekem chayim. The arguments of Basil and the arguments of Eishamai, both were said by the Ribbon Shalom to Moshe Rabbeinu and Arsinai. The hachra, that is the job of the Bez Neshel Mata. This is the amazing interpretation of the Ritva. It's been pointed out that Rashi seems to differ with this. Rashi in Ksubus Nafnun Zayin brings a different pshat in the Elu Ve'elu Diri Lekim Chayim. Rashi says all it means is that both arguments have merit. Meaning that in a given set of circumstances, the halacha is one way or the other. We could not say both are emes. Elu Ve'elu only means that both arguments have merit because in a slightly different set of circumstances, the halacha may be different. So, for example, if uh, two chachamim argue and one says chayev, one says pater, one is right and one is wrong in a given set of circumstances. But it doesn't mean that the one who's wrong is totally off base. His arguments could have merit in a slightly different set of circumstances. But in the specific set of circumstances about which they are discussing, one is right and one is wrong. Kimiduma, the assumption is that the Ritva and Rashi disagree. Whereas Rashi understands that in any machlekes lahalacha, there was one correct opinion, there was an incorrect opinion. It doesn't mean that uh, the incorrect opinion is totally off base. But in this given set of circumstances, one is right and one is wrong. We should study both because it could be in a slightly different case, the other arguments will carry the day. According to the Ritva, the Ritva is saying in the same set of circumstances, Elu ve'elu de relikim chayim. Because both approaches are consistent with kola terakula. They are both consistent with what was given to Moshe ben Sinai. The weighing of the stadium, that is the job of the Bezna Shalmata, and Akhar Baruch was uninvolved in that process. That is what the Ridva seems to say. Tremendous, tremendous Kiddush. I'd like to share with you a Zayar Akadosh, which seems to endorse the position of the Ridva and show that in Machlaikis, there is the possibility that both are MS, and it happens to be a Zayar Akadosh relevant to Rosh Hashanah. This is a Zayar Kodesh from Parshas Pinchas. And it's commenting on a Pasuk. It says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu judges Mishpat Amo Yisrael Dvar Yom Biyomo. That Hashem judges the Jewish people Yom Biyomo, daily. So the Zayar asks, Yom Biyomo Mahu, what is this expression of Yom Biyomo, day by day? Elahane Treyayman Rosh Hashanah. This is a reference to the two days of Rosh Hashanah. 
Now, the truth is that the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Lachaira are only observed because of a suffix. Because when they were Makadash al when they were Makadash the new month, based on the observation of the new moon, so it couldn't be known whether the previous month would be a 29 day month, a Chaydash Chaser, or whether it would be a Chaydash Molay, a 30 day month. And consequently, it wouldn't be known when Rosh Chaydash, Rosh Chaydash Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, of course, would be on one day or on the next day. So in the Makam Havad, in the meeting place of the Bezdin, that could be known. But outside of the Makam Havad, even in Eretz Yisrael, it couldn't be known. Consequently, we observe two days of Rosh Hashanah. But Lachar, the observance of two days of Rosh Hashanah is really misophic. Because outside of the meeting place of the Bezdin, outside of the Makam Havad, it wasn't known which day was declared to be Rosh Hashanah. But the Zayar says that no, that both days are necessary. Amai Treyayin, why are there two days? Begin the Inon Trey Beidina. Because there are two courts, the Mishabra and Kechada, that join together. There are two judgments. There's the judgment of the first day and the judgment of the second day. What are the two judgments? Dina Ilah, the higher judgment. The Iu Kashia, which is very, very hard. Bedina Tata, and it's joined with the lower judgment, the Iu Rafia, which is softer. Vitarvaya Mishtakhi, and both are fat. And that means an amazing thing that even though really the observance of the two days of Rosh Hashanah are misafek, but in Shamayim, there really are two judgments. The judgment of the first day is Dina Kashia. And the judgment of the second day is Dina Rafia, and these two judgments are both relevant. There's a very beautiful mimer from Rav Dessler in the second chaylik of the Mechta Meliyah where he talks about it, exactly what is the meaning of these two judgments, how are the two judgments different. But for our purposes, the Zayar Kader says both judgments are true. The Alda, the Zayar continues, and regarding this, Lo Yadi Hani Bavloi, the Babylonians don't know. Raza di Abava Vialalta. And we know that there are two sounds of the trua. There's the sound that we call trua, which is the nine short blasts, the staccato blasts. And there's the sound that we call shvari, the three longer sounds. The, what we call trua, the Gemara calls yalala. What we call shvarim, the Gemara calls yabava. So the Gemara says, Velo Yadi, they don't realize, the Babylonians, the Tervayu with Spichu, that we need both. Why? Yalalusa, the Iu Dina Takifa. Because the Yalala, that which we call the Trua, the nine short staccato blasts, that address, addresses the, the difficult din. And plus Tvirim, and the three Shivarim, the Iu Diu Rafia, that addresses the softer din. So in Lo Yadi, they don't know. Vav and Tervayu, and therefore they do both. Vanan Yadinan, but we do know Vav Gin and Tervayu, and we do both. Vachula Nafkin Lairach Kshayt, and all go the Derech Ha'emes. Now here also there's a Suffolk. Now you learn the Sugin Rosh Hashanah to be shiny, you get the impression that there were various Shittas as to when the Torah uses the word true, what does it mean? Does it mean that which we call true? Does it mean that which we call shvarim? Maybe it means even both. So the Gemara says that Rebovo was Masakin in Kesri that to be, we should be able to say all the shittas. Right? Just to cover all our bases. We go with the shittas that it's shvarim, we go with the shittas that it's true, we go with the shittas that it's both. But it really is ultimately misafik, because we don't know. We don't know what the Torah meant. Says of Shem Yochai that the Babylonians don't know and therefore they do both misafik. But we do know that both are necessary. Because each different sound of the shaifer addresses a different aspect of the judgment. And therefore we do both, and everything goes b'derach ha'emes. So what do you see from this zayar? You see an amazing thing, that there's a certain hashgach, there's a certain divine providence, even in the way that doubts arise and are settled. You have a situation 
We're outside of the base of Ad. No one knows which day was Rosh Hashanah. The Mishnah says on the Sechus Rosh Hashanah that this wasn't meant to be. In the beginning, they would light signal fires, and in moments, the word could spread from Eretz Yisrael to Babel, and people would know exactly when the Kiddush HaKadosh was. Misha Kilkulu Hakusim, when there was a Kilkul, when it was messed up, they began lighting fires on the wrong nights. So Eskinu Shushluchim Yotzim, they had to send messengers. But the messengers only work for Sukkot, for Pesach. We have 15 days from Rosh Chodesh to allow for travel till the Yontif. But for Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Chodesh. Word can't spread. So therefore, as a consequence of the fact they couldn't light the Masuas, now the Allah is no one would know when Rosh Hashanah was, and that keep two days. So we think, okay, because of the changed circumstances, therefore we suffer we have to observe two days. Nakhod Baruch let a different cup on. Nakhod Baruch said, "No, we need two days of Rosh Hashanah." At some point in time, Nakhod Baruch determined there had to be a dina rafia in addition to the dina kashia. For those people that couldn't be zayich din in the dina kashia in the difficult judgment, there has to be a second chance, and that second chance is the second day. That's the dina rafia. I think it's possible that many of us. Maybe our only zoicha on the second day. Maybe many of us aren't zoicha in the Dina Kasha. We're only zoicha in the Dina Rafia. But Akkadus Baruch orchestrated that circumstances should bring about that there should be a safe. Why? So that we should have the two days because we really need both. And then the sounds of the shaifer also fall into place because the various sounds of the shaifer also address the two judgments. Right? The true. Uh, suppresses the Mida Sadin of the Dina Kashia. The Shvarim suppresses the Mida Sadin of the Dina Rafia. And we need both. So even though we would have thought, and above all, Taka thought, that it really was Misafek, but in reality, Akkadim Baruch Hu pulls the strings and he understands we need both the Shvarim and the Shuvah, so there will be both the Shvarim and the Shuvah. Which means that Alpi Said, in the Say Hadvarim, that which on the level of Pshat, Seems to be a suffix. As the Zayar says, everything goes on Darach HaEmes on the level of sight. I believe that in Eilu, Eilu, Devi, Leikim, Chayim, that's also the Mahalach. You you have two Chacham who are disputing a point of Halacha. And this one says, this is the Halacha and you're wrong. And the other one says, no, this is the Halacha and you're wrong. Certainly, from their perspective, they don't believe Eilu Eilu Diver Lekim Chayim. They don't believe both are right. They believe each one believes only I'm right. I'm right and you're wrong. And they're convinced of that. And they will argue the point, Mamish, like the Gemara says, that when Tamir Chacham argue a halacha, they're like enemies, at least initially, until there's a resolution. So when they argue this point in halacha, they don't rely on the principle of Eilu Eilu Diver Lekim Chayim. Each one genuinely believes that he is right and the other is totally 1,000% wrong. But that doesn't have bearing on the Emes. The Emes in the Sayyid HaTvarim is Taka Eilu Eilu Diver Lekim Chayim. Klape Shemaya Galia, they're both are Emes. That's one Hagdom. Another Hagdom. When we talk about Torah, what Torah does for a person, it's not only that Torah tells us what to do. Obviously, it's an important part of Torah. Torah guides us in normative practice. But Torah does more than that. And let me bring it out this way. I don't need this proof, but I think that this uh, is a succinct expression of the idea. When we saw Salanter in the Yigera Samusar talks about the idea that Torah is a tavlin for the Yetzir Hara. Chazal say, Barasi Yetzir Hara, Barasi Torah tavlin. I made the Yetzir Hara, I made Torah as an antidote. So Rishol says 
The Torah is a tablet for the Yitzhara in two ways. One way is when you learn the halachas that pertain to a certain area of observance, you become more scrupulous in that area of observance. If your Shmira Shabbos is a little lax, learn Hilcha Shabbos and you'll become strengthened. If your Shmira Salasha is a little lax, so learn Chavetz Chaim and you'll be strengthened. It doesn't explain fully what the idea is, but I think the idea is Pasha. Because we know that the Sahara has great inroads when there is a lack of clarity as far as the halacha goes. We don't really know what the halacha is. You assume probably there's some opinion that permits it. But when you uh, learn the halacha as well, and you discover, no, that in this practice, there is no opinion that permits it. This is certainly 1,000% osir. Then you know that uh, once you have clarity in terms of the halacha, then you'll observe it scrupulously. Very few people are willing to violate what they know is the halacha. Well, when there's a lack of clarity, then you figure um, everything is a machlaikas. Probably there's an opinion that permits this too. So therefore, if you want to be mischazic in a certain area of halachic observance, learn the halacha that's relevant to that thing, and you'll be strengthened. But Rousseau Salante says there's also something spiritual to Torah. He says that when you learn Torah, it sanctifies the soul, it elevates the soul to the extent that it raises you above the other. And here, says of Yisrael, it doesn't have to be you study something relevant to the particular problem you're dealing with. He says if a person learns Perek Shor Shinaga Chesapara, if a person learns the mission of the Kama that talks about torts, the damages of a bull goring a cow, he's going to speak less Lashon Hara. He says, what does Shor Shinaga have to do with Lashon Hara? So we're not dealing with something which is logical or rational. It's, it's the Kedusha Satayra, it's the holiness of Torah. The holiness of Torah has the power to transform and elevate a person. And that's the what you're learning. If you're learning Shosh Nagach Sapara, it'll affect your Shmir Salasha. If you're learning Masech uh, Shabbos, you'll daven better. That's the spiritual aspect of Torah being taught. The question is this, that let's say our Torah could be corrupted. Let's say there was a possibility of shikhas ha of Torah being forgotten, Torah being mangled, Torah being corrupted. So the Torah that we would have after the mangling wouldn't be Torah anymore. All the schoolists, the kedusha, the holiness, the way in which Torah can inspire us, it wouldn't work. It's not Torah anymore. In the same way, reading the New York Times isn't going to make you a better person. Reading something which you think is Torah but isn't Torah is also not going to make you a better person. Right? The problem of Asida Torah Shetakach Mi Yisrael is not just a problem that if Torah is forgotten, you won't know what to do. That's a halbutzara. For that, there are atzis. You don't know what to do, be mafner, be strict. You're not sure whether it's mutter, don't do it. Right? For the lack of knowledge, there are atzis. But I see the Torah talks me Yisrael. What Rav says, what the Tanakhama of the Brisa says, is that not just the Torah will be forgotten, people won't know what to do. That the shikha satir will corrupt the Torah. It won't be Torah anymore. And that is a bigger problem. That's not just a problem of not knowing what to do. Not knowing what to do, for that there are solutions. You don't know what to do. There are rules. But if the Torah is corrupted, if the Torah is, is distorted, it's not Torah anymore. It's not Torah anymore. That is the danger. And that means all the schoolists of Torah, that Torah with its Kedusha, can do to uplift and transform and bring sanctity to the world, that won't be there. That's what Rav and the Tanakhan were worried about. Because as we said, they held that the Haftacha of Kilosi Shachach Pizarro only goes in the Shiras Hazinu, not in the rest of Torah. And therefore the possibility exists that Torah will be corrupted. 
And in fact, you look at the Gemara and Shabbos, the example they gave was an example of a psak halacha, which is absolutely, absolutely inconsistent with other halachas of the Torah. That there'll be a corruption of Torah. A corruption of Torah isn't just you're doing the wrong thing. A corruption of Torah means it's not Torah anymore. To that, Rabbi Shem Yochai says, Chas v'shalom. It says, Torah will never be corrupted among the true students of Torah. I, there may be a situation you don't know what to do. That's true. It's true. Right? If there won't be Halacha Brura and Mishnah Brura of Makam Echad, There'll be many, many situations where the mice said, we don't know what to do. But that's not a problem. Not knowing what to do is not a problem. The problem is, but is there a corruption of Torah? Says of Shem there's no corruption of Torah. Because Elu Elu de Velikim Chai. There's Machlaikas. There's Taka Machlaikas. As the Sifri says, there's no Dover Boru. This Chacham is Metame, this Chacham is Metaira, there's no Dover Boru. We don't know what to do, Halach Lamais. But Torah hasn't been corrupted because both are part of Torah. Because Elu Velo de Velikim Chaim. The Machlokas, where the Torah can be forgotten, is this that according to the Rav and the Tanakhamu, if Torah can be forgotten, it means not just that people will not know what to do, it means that Torah can be corrupted to the extent that it's no longer Torah anymore. And that's halfway Vafela. That's the, the, the terrible, the most terrible thing imaginable. You see, not being able to eat the kikar of truma because you don't know whether it's tamay or tar, that's not a tragedy. So you won't need to eat something else. That's not the half level of fella. The half level of fella is that we've lost Torah. Because if Torah is forgotten, that means if Torah can be corrupted, it's no longer Torah. That's the, the half level of fella. That they believe that it's possible. The worst Einish of the Torah is that we can come to a state where essentially we have no Torah anymore. Why? Because it's been totally corrupted. And that, Rabbi Shomri Yochai says, Chas v'shalom sh'tashtakach Torah Yisrael. Yes, there could be a time that people won't know what to do. Because we'll have Mishnah Brura, but not Halakha Brura. As the Sufi says, this Chacham Metame, this Chacham Metayer, so we won't know what to do. The kicker is so true, we won't be able to eat. But it'll all be tired. Because Eilu Veilu, they really can chai. So therefore, the terror that we learn will inspire us, it'll uplift us, it will refine us. All the schoolers of terror we'll still have. <laughs> we won't know what to do with that loaf of bread, whether we can eat it or not. But that's not a tragedy. So therefore, he said, But now we can understand something. This may be a little bit of Derech Hadrush. Very interesting thing. In the Hagdama to Lakute Maharat, Rabbi Nachman Dreslev, his Talmud Rabbi Nosson brings this Gemara in Shabbos. The Rabbi Shimon Boyuchai says that Torah will not be forgotten. Ki losi shachach mipizaro. And he says that in that pasuk, there is a remez to Rav Shem Yochai. Because the Saifei Tevis of Ki Lo Si Shachach Mi Pi Zaro Spell Yochai. Ki lo si shachach mipi zaro, the sofei tevis, the last letters of those words, spell yochai. Torah will not be forgotten, mizaro, from the seed of yochai, referring to himself, Rav Shumar Yochai. Which means that this teaching of Rav Shumar Yochai is in some sense Rav Shumar Yochai l'shitaso. It's somehow related to him personally. It isn't just that he happened to be the one that said it. But it somehow is consistent with his chalik and Torah. And the feet of Arena we understand. Because the idea that when you have machlaikas, elu ve'elu, is really part of the chalik hasayid of Torah. 
It's what the Zayir HaKadr says, that in Babel they didn't know, but we know. In other words, because Aldera HaPshat, on the superficial level, when you have a Machlaikas, one is right and one is wrong. And therefore, every Machlaikas points to a corruption of Torah. Every Machlaikas means something was lost and something was corrupted. It's only Rishon B'yachai in the Chayel HaKasayin of Torah reveals that it's not that way. That Eilu Eilu Dira Lekim Chayim means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Mashgiach to make sure that what is meant to be is. And if there are two opinions that rise, such as the Shvarim and the Trua, or there is a question of which day of Rosh Hashanah, or whether it's Rashi's Tefillin or Minatam's Tefillin, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. But they both reveal dimensions of Taira that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to be brought into this world. And therefore, since this idea that Machlaikas does not entail corruption of Taira, but the contrary, that both Stadim of the Machlaikas are part of the true revelation of Taira, is something which comes from the Chelek Asaud. That's Rav Shem Yochai's Chelek and Torah. That's what he reveals. And therefore, Rav Shem Yochai says, Chas v'shal. This is something only Rav Shem Yochai could say. Since Rav Shem Yochai is the author of the Zayar, and he is the teacher of the Chelek HaSayin of Torah, the Klal Yisrael, he says to the others that you think Machlaikas entails the corruption of Torah. Chas v'shal. Chas v'shal. Shetak the Torah of Yisrael. There's no corruption. Is there a fact that we don't know what to do? That's true. We don't know what to do. There's no halacha brewer, Mishnah brewer, Makavacha. But, but it's all tired. And hours late, there's a very beautiful mimer from the foot in the Zechah Sadak Mavracha, in the Pachat Yitzchak and Chanukah, Simon Gimel, who discusses this point. And he says a very, very interesting thing. There's a Gemara in Menachas that says, that pa'amim should be tula shal teira he yisayda. Sometimes the bitl of teira is its establishment. So where do we see this from? It says the Moshe ben Baruch Luchas. So Hashem said, Asher she barta, yasher kayach she barta. He gave Moshe, you know, yasher kayach for breaking the luchas. Breaking the luchas, you think there's no bigger bitl teira than breaking the luchas? But it had a constructive purpose. So sometimes that which appears to be destructive really is constructive. Pa'amim should be tula shal teira is kiyuma. So the question is, okay, so give me an example. <laughs> Besides the luchas. Give me another example of where bitl teira is constructive. So Rashi struggles. Rashi says, it's the halacha, the muvatlim talmud teira la'itzuas ha'meis v'lachnas ha'skama. Sometimes you put aside Torah study for various mitzvahs. That's the case of be tula zui, it's hard to understand how doing that mitzvah somehow enhances Torah, improves Torah. But Rav Futner says, and Rav Tzadok HaKayin says the same thing in Parshas Baloischa. And it means this, that Shikha Satayra, Shikha Satayra, we would think is the greatest tragedy. Torah being forgotten. But the truth is that Shikha Satayra can come to a rebuy of Taira. For example, let's say there's a halacha, and you know the halacha very well. And anyone who asks you the shayla on the spot, you can answer this is the halacha. It's just, you know the halacha. Let's say you would forget the halacha. Let's say you forget the halacha. And now you have to try to restore the halacha based on everything else that you know. By making comparisons, being with Dama Milsa Lamilsa, drawing analogies, bringing proofs. Through that process, when you come to the conclusion, it may be the same conclusion that you knew all along, but it'll be a different level of understanding. Right now, it's not just you know what the halach is. You've thought it through, you know the reasons, you know the pros, the cons, the counter arguments. You know how slightly different conditions could change the ultimate psaac. So the, the forgetting of the Torah 
right, brought you, when you restored the halach with your pilpul, it brought you to a deeper understanding, a broader understanding of Torah. The Gemara says that Gimel Alfei Halachas Nishtak Chumayab Lushal Maisha. There were 3,000 halachas that were forgotten during the period of Moshe Rabbeinu's mourning. And they were mourning for Moshe Rabbeinu. And Asniel ben Kanaz restored them with his pilpul. When he restored them, it wasn't just he restored them to the way they were before Moshe had died. When he restored them with his pilpul, there was a rebuy of Torah, there was more Torah, there was a deeper understanding and, and Havana and application was a different thing. The footnote says it's the same thing, that when Shikha Satayra results in there being two opinions, then we certainly have a rebuy of Torah. Because now, Elu the Elu Dibir Lekim Chayim. Before the Shikha, there was one opinion. So there was one opinion. And that was Dibir Lekim Chayim. But because of the Shikha, now brought about two opinions about which Elu the Elu Dibir Lekim Chayim, there are new dimensions of Torah that are revealed. He points out that the Xeris of Yavam, Mashkicham Torah they wanted to cause us to forget the Torah. And to a certain extent, they were successful. They brought a Shikhas Torah. Because we know that Machlaikis originated during the Tkuf of Golos Yavam. But that Shikhas Torah wasn't the Shikhas Torah that was the tragedy, the corruption of Torah. It was the Shikha Satayra that led to a rebuy of Torah. Because Eilu Eilu Devei Lekim Chai. So the, the defeat of the Yavanim was handed to them through their own efforts. That their efforts at bringing Allah Shikicham Torah Secha brought about a rebuy of Torah, a deeper understanding, a broader understanding of Torah. They caused their own defeat. But this is the idea of Roshim Be'yochai, that lo sishachach m'pi zara. This is the haftach. The haftach is Torah will not be corrupted. Because there'll be a rebuy of deus, but eilu ve'elu di velekem chayim. This is the revelation that Roshim Be'yochai, al pi reveals. And therefore, it's true that there may be situations that we don't know what to do. That we live in a time where there are so many deus. Sometimes in terms of Allah HaLamaysa, we don't know what to do. But in terms of, of what Torah can do, the transformational power of Torah, we have more Torah. We have Torah that we can sink our teeth into. We have Torah that can, that can engage us and challenge us and, and, and excite us. And in turn, all the schoolers of Torah, in terms of how it refines and shamas and uplifts us, and, and is an end of the Yitzhara, are all present even in that Torah which lacks the clarity of not having halacha brura, mishnah brura, makayim, echad.